can start others can join in as and when they come in all others are requested to kindly mute themselves except the ones who are speaking thank you sir hello everyone good morning and on behalf of c3s i welcome you all to today's session c3s institutional dialogue on the topic the pentagon's china report 2020 for the us congress to present this topic we have with us mr manoj kevadramani and mr suresh desai both from takshashila bangalore to give out the bio so speaker mr manoj kevadramani is a fellow china studies at the takshashila institution his research primarily focuses on chinese politics foreign policy and approaches to new technologies prior to joining takshashila mr manoj spent 11 years working as a journalist in india and china where he also helped set up digital newsrooms and train young journalists Mr. Manoj's work has been published by many media outlets, including NDTV, Beyond, Al Jazeera, CGTN, and the Diplomat. He also curates a weekly brief, Eye on China, which is well received in tracking the developments in China from an Indian perspective. Moving on to Mr. Suresh Desai, he is a research analyst at the Takshashila Institution. His MPhil dissertation was on the topic India and regionalism in Asia. Previously, he has done masters in political science and holds a diploma in international law. This research area includes China, India's foreign policy, and strategic studies. Prior to joining Takshashila, he has worked with the Outlook magazine, the Indian Express, and the Indian Council for World Affairs in various capacities. A warm welcome to both our speakers, and we're extremely delighted to have you with us today. To introduce the topic, knowing the adversary well is half the battle. One goes to say. In 2019, we saw the People's Republic of China celebrating the 70th anniversary of its formation. 2020 marks an another important year for the PLA as it works to achieve important modernization milestones ahead of the Chinese Communist Party's broader goal to transform China into a moderately prosperous society by the CCP centenary year, which happens to be 2021. For 20 years, the U.S. Department of Defense (DoD) has provided the U.S. Congress with an annual report on military and security developments involving the China, involving China. These reports have generally assessed the contours of China's national strategy, its approach to security and military affairs, and potential changes in the PRC's armed forces over the next 20 years, among other matters. As the world continues to respond to the growing strategic challenges posed by China, we at C3S see this as an opportunity to assess both the continuity and change that have taken place in the China's PLA strategy and its armed forces over the past two decades. So, standing in between the audience and the speaker. I would like to hand over to Commodore Aras Vasan sir, India Navy retired, for director's remarks. Over to you, sir. Vasan sir, over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. I just had a little difficulty in unmuting. It says don't. You continue to remain muted. So that was the order given by my computer. So I had to override it. All right. So first of all, a big uh, thank you to both the speakers for uh, joining us this morning to look at a very important study that's been in the public domain for some time, and a lot of analysis has also taken place as far as uh, you know how China is moving forward with specific time targets. You know, one is of course the 2021 target where they want a moderately uh, you know prosperous society. You know, you can define it in any other way which you want. But uh, that is not far away; it's just next year. So obviously, this COVID and whatever else has happened has sub, sub, uh, made them also suffer a setback to a certain extent. Other thing which came out in the report, which I said some time ago, I don't remember all the salients. Uh, what came out clearly is that uh, I'm sure they'll I'll be corrected if I'm uh, I misinterpreted it. This report does not include the India-China standoff after the COVID, though it makes references to. The uh, you know the standoff of Doklam and uh, what happened in uh, mid 2019 etc. Another important point which of course uh, I didn't remember that time I just brushed up to see how many times India has been mentioned in the report, which gives you a certain amount of uh, uh, indication on where the thrust was. This is to bring out a relative comparison. India or Indian Ocean together have been mentioned 40 times in the report. Now nowadays you know it does not require you to sit down and count. All you have to do is uh, ask the computer to do it, and it does it for you. And I found out that uh, India has been mentioned 40 times. India, stroke Indian Ocean, Pakistan has been mentioned only once, and that too with respect to the China's interest in Gwadar. 
no prizes for guessing how many times Taiwan has been mess, uh, mentioned. 160 times. You know, obviously, America is placing a lot of importance on what's happening in the Taiwan Strait and perhaps looks at it as uh, something that it needs to contend with and prepare for perhaps a cross uh, strait uh, invasion. Then also, it mentions about uh, uh, the defense expenditure. Uh, you know, what comes out clearly is that uh, we are spending about 60. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the 60 versus 170, that means they are three times they are spending the money, but also they have many more uh, theaters of the reorganization. They have South China Sea to look after. They have other adversaries, uh, Japan, us on land, etc., etc. So, uh, <clears throat> South Korea has been mentioned four times, and North Korea has been mentioned many more number of times. So, you know, the reason I wanted to bring this out is also some of these reports. So tell you as to where the focus lies and based on the mere count of the number of times it's there and thereafter following it up with your detailed study it will give you an indication this is also for the researchers who are with us uh, to say how they can perhaps reorient the way to look at voluminous studies i think this goes to more than 180 pages or 200 pages so it is important with the voluminous data that's available to be able to carry out a thorough research and see what pointers it holds for India, because after all, we are interested in seeing what is said in terms of India and what is the assessment of China in other theatres, like the, the assessment which is there about uh, their missile capabilities, whether it is land launched or whether it is sea based, uh, where uh, you know they are way ahead. And as a, as a person who served in the Navy for 34 years, I was more interested in finding out how their Navy has grown. And the report is categoric in saying in sheer numbers they already overtaken america so they are looking at 350 naval vessels of all description but it's only quantity again as a naval officer let me tell you it's just a quantity and not entirely quality also the geographic challenges that they have you know in terms of crossing over from south china sea to indian ocean to protect their uh, interests here and also to sustain anti paris emissions takes a lot of juice out of their ships because you are looking at thousands of 9,000 to 10,000 kilometers of journey through the Malacca Straits to reach their areas of interest. So these are some of the uh, things, you know, of course, not that everything has been said in specific terms, but it's for us to analyze and see how India is affected because of China's growth and its ambitions. And from the report to try and see how we can generate our own report and our own counters. But unfortunately, that leaves us in a position of being always reactive and responsive and not proactive. So obviously, there is a need for us now to get a little more proactive and look at what needs to be done so without waiting for China to develop A or B or C. And therefore, this is where perhaps I look at the usefulness of this debate today, where I am sure that both the speakers will concentrate on how India should prepare in the light of this report that tells us what has been done, how much has been done, how much time is available for us to, one, react definitely and respond like we've done uh, uh, in the trans-Himalayan aggression. The other is to have our own shape, our own uh, policies, which are not totally dependent on what China is doing. So with that, uh, let me hand over to the speakers and uh, hope uh, uh, you know the, the opening remarks are appropriate in terms of setting the tone for our conversation today. Thank you. So, would you like me to go ahead? Yes, Mr. Mahesh. Okay, Mr. so Mahesh. I'm just going to try and present uh, my screen, right? Just one second. Sure. Uh, do let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. uh, essentially, uh, thank you, firstly, everyone, for having me here and having us here, both of us, Suyash and me. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be, to be able to do this. Um, as Kamara Vasan said, uh, I just wanted to make a couple of remarks on what Kamara Vasan just said. Uh, firstly, uh, the references to different areas, territories, countries, regions, um, also indicate uh, not just American priorities, but also their sense of what China's priorities and insecurities are. And Taiwan, therefore, is obviously critical to uh, the broader objective. Um, as far as, uh, you know, their naval development, I completely agree with what Commodore, Commodore Vasan is saying is that, uh, you know, there are specific uh, weaknesses, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, 
in terms of say how do you integrate all this wonderful new technology these wonderful new vessels that the chinese are building uh, how do you get the right manpower for that um, do you have skilled manpower how do they train how do they then therefore adapt to these technologies uh, and also then finally getting sort of operational experience in farsis uh, also overcoming the limitations of geography to operate in places like the indian ocean and to have staying power essentially in these areas potentially with bases and so on and so forth so there is a long way for the pla navy to actually become a global force and i think that's important for us in india to keep in mind given that there is a significant amount of propaganda that comes from china which tells us that they have already arrived uh, which is not necessarily the case um, and i think that's sort of important for us to understand because that's where we can then draw also what are exactly our objectives and where can we also compete more vigorously um and i'm hoping that uh, through this conversation we can end up uh, with a conversation about exactly what india can do and should be doing for the purpose of my presentation uh, what i've done is that i've tried to focus on what the report talks about in terms of uh, the strategic outlook of china um the growing global presence of the pla um it's fairly short on specifics in many ways this report it gives you this broad picture yet uh, the specifics are not there uh, i can understand why they're not there they're not necessarily pur the purpose of it is not to be there in the public domain necessarily they might be parts of sort of classified uh, annexures to this um, but there are certain claims that it makes which are uh, which to my understanding are sort of a little overblown uh, and also tailored towards a domestic audience of policy makers uh, which the pentagon wants to also address for its own purposes and i think that's something that we need to also keep in mind while we make our assessments of this report um so what i thought i'd do is i'd speak about the strategic outlook i'll talk about pls global presence um why and how it's going about some of these things i'll talk about uh, the focus on technology um and i'll try and present some work that i have done on its uh, march towards uh, developing an intelligent force uh, and what that would imply uh, predominantly for even india um thereafter there's lots of heavy lifting that has to be done on a number of different aspects of the report which uh, you know i've uh, uh, very uh, politely sort of pulled rank on suresh and said that he must do the heavy lifting of this um but yeah but i'll begin uh, with this so firstly the big idea is that the report talks about and i think we've heard this phrase over and over again for the last 7 8 10 years now the great reju rejuvenation of the chinese nation that's the broad strategic objective it's obviously a very vague objective because you can't really have tangible markers to something like this but uh, it, it has something in terms of uh, placing china at the center stage of world affairs which will entail obviously mean to have a certain degree of uh, a greater enhanced global role for its armed forces um it's sort of implicit in what this phrase implies and it also harks back of of course the term rejuvenation harks back to a time where uh, the where xi jinping and the communist party believed that china was at the center stage of world affairs um what this has meant uh, in terms of policy uh, and in terms of practice domestically is that it's entailed a strict ideological adherence domestically um there's an interesting paper out uh, by timing chung who talks about uh, you know the securitization of the chinese state uh, and party under xi jinping and ideology is a critical component of that i mean xi jinping has used ideology uh, starting very early on to try and define a specific chinese system um, you know uh, he sort of done that to try and differentiate how china governs itself or how the party governs china uh from western models of governance um and that's really important because in some ways uh this comes from a perception of being locked in systemic conflict with the west in particular but also with probably other systems but predominantly the west and this idea of universal western values and their infiltration um and that's led to the sort of return to ideological dictums not necessarily of the maoist uh, variety which talks about sort of global revolution and constant internal revolution uh, and obviously get complete sort of state uh, control of the economy uh, but some sort of a balance in those ways but yet in terms of how the party is governed uh, very very strict ideological adherence with political loyalty being uh, uh, primary for cadres to go forward um why this is important from the point of view of the forces is because 
whenever you perceive the world around you as essentially confrontational as in terms of a systemic confrontation going on uh, and you double down on your ideology for whatever your purpose is one critical purpose was also to because uh, when xi jinping took power corruption was a huge issue and there was a sense that uh, the party was essentially collapsing with under its own weight of contradictions um, and therefore this sort of ideological rejuvenation for the lack of a better word was needed um, what you ended what you also end up is creating a siege mentality within yourself um, because if you constantly remind yourself of how different you are and how you are constantly under threat because of how different you are you also cultivate a siege mentality for yourself and of course when you use language like infiltration of ideas and so on and so forth that creates that mentality even further and that ends up leading to greater securitization of policies around everything that you do um, and that's where eventually your sort of forces come into play um, so that's one important thing um, the other aspect of this has been as part of great rejuvenation has been modernization of governance um, the fourth plenum uh, uh, of the party 19th Congress uh, last year in November last year laid out a roadmap for what modernization of governance meant it essentially talked about a bunch of different areas in which essentially you need to improve service delivery along with maintaining uh, integrity of uh, carders officials and so on and so forth using technology uh, cutting sort of bureau bureaucratic sort of formalism and red tape and all of that and laid down processes for obviously supervision for each of these that's again an important factor which often doesn't get mentioned is that a lot of uh, the focus of the party is about improving efficiency in service delivery quality of service delivery in many ways and also in terms of how it engages with people to ensure sort of in some ways customer satisfaction so that they can continue to remain in power now this also then sort of bleeds into your armed forces because the idea is that you need to modernize governance across the board and for that you also need to modernize your armed forces because challenges to your governance are coming from many many different directions and that sort of bleeds into this idea of specific targets for the modernization of the armed forces so 2020 uh, was the uh, you know if you go back to Xi Jinping's 19th party congress speech he speaks about 2020 being uh, when mechanization has to be achieved 2035 is when not 2035 per se but the next step on that is informatization and the subsequent step for the modernization of the PLA is intelligentization um, and that roadmap sort of talks about essentially a more connected force which has first and foremost achieved high level of sort of uh, equipment development through high level of industrial capacity uh, and subsequently then these things are far more these things are brewed with sort of uh, imbued with greater sort of information warfare capacity and then thirdly they are connected far more deeper through intelligent warfare capacity um, and I think that's the other point that this paper makes that, uh, that this uh, report makes the third thing is about uh, cultivating greater national power uh, to advance national security and development and interest of course power has to serve a certain end uh, power is a means to an end power is not an end in necessarily itself and that's how the communist party also looks at it uh, it has to advance your security and developmental interests uh, lastly the objective of sort of uh, your forces is external engagement is uh, not just to do that to cultivate and to serve uh, you know developmental and security interests but also to shape a favorable external environment now often uh, when the chinese if in chinese propaganda in chinese reportage you will see this in the context of dialogue mechanisms and so on and so forth yet force is an important tool in china's sort of dialogue strategy and the paper actually even mentions this that dialogue is one part of a sort of gap toolkit that the Chinese tend to use uh, and again that's something to keep in mind so that's the sort of broad strategic outlook uh, that they use and I think this last point about shaping a favorable external environment I'll go into it further going uh, in the next slide but uh, the idea of doing that using force and dialogue concurrently is something that we are also seeing at the moment um, in Eastern Ladakh we've seen it in South China Sea um, uh, the objective is not necessarily to overwhelm uh, through force because when you overwhelm through force, there are uh, many variables that come into play uh, and those can be beyond your control. Even currently what force has been used can lead to many sort of uh, miscalculations like we just talked about, which can lead to things going beyond your control. But the idea is to use force strategically in a way where it's 
uh, it works along with other to other tools to be able to shape that favorable external environment that you need um, now, how have they sort of done this in the paper talks about this, right? You know, the external threats and opportunities that the PRC sees in terms of shaping this external environment. Um, the paper, this Pentagon's report draws from uh, the 2019 defense white paper the Chinese had put out. It talks about how China views the external environment. It talks about how China says that there is a deepening strategic competition between states, between major powers. And this is particularly the case in the Asia Pacific. Um, and there are therefore a set of actions that the Chinese have taken, which the paper doesn't necessarily refer to. Uh, one example is obviously this new uh, global strategic partnership with the Russians. Uh, but beyond that, it talks about how the party views the external environment. Uh, I've already mentioned systems competition. That's one perspective of how the party views the external environment. Uh, the other aspect is this major country competition in the Asia Pacific. Um, this is not just in the context of uh, big changes that are taking place uh, in US policy towards Asia Pacific, particularly under Trump. Under Obama, we had the pivot to Asia Pacific. Under Trump, we have uh, you know the policy of can you pay for your can you pay for our pivot in the asia pacific um so therefore trump is sort of on with in these negotiations with the japanese with south koreans uh, about burden sharing and most of these haven't necessarily gone too far yet at the same time he's sort of opened up the opportunities for some of these states to pursue different uh, different policies in japan we saw a shift in policy under abe uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens under the new prime minister right now um and there was a sense of trying to balance all interests. I mean, the fact that the Japanese eventually, uh, the Chinese eventually saw, saw merit in uh, Xi Jinping, particularly saw merit in actually meeting Shinzo Abe after years of essentially ducking a bilateral meeting uh, tells you a little bit about how even they were reassessing things. Um, but the defense 19, 2019 defense white paper is quite interesting because it also talks about how, you know, there is a greater sense among countries in the Asia Pacific region uh, that they are part of, quote unquote, this community of shared common destiny. Uh, so there is a greater confidence that that paper projects about opportunities. Um, what's also interesting, and this again is not mentioned in the in this uh, DOD report, is that uh, despite all of this, and despite the sort of increased flux and increased competition, China still continues to see itself, and even despite COVID right now, and what's happened from COVID, China still continues to see itself, or the Chinese leadership continues to see themselves in a period of strategic opportunity. Um, this is from Xi Jinping's speech a couple of weeks ago, on the 14th five-year plan um, and that's an interesting takeaway that uh, this is a phrase that was used over a decade and a half or so ago uh, talking about how uh, you know there continues to be this space for china to expand and pursue its strategic objectives and interesting that despite everything that's happened over this past year this competition with the us uh, not just in the asia not just in the indo pacific but also in the asia pacific and also broadly uh, far more aggressively this decoupling that's taking place uh, Xi Jinping still continues to see China in a period of strategic opportunities. Um, this sort of brings us to one sort of contradiction which this DOD report highlights. And I think it's an interesting contradiction that they highlight where they talk about the fact that China sees global engagement as critical to its developmental and security needs. Um, it obviously is not at the place where it can impose its writ, its writ on the world. Uh, the world is sort of far enough far away right now it's not even in a position to actually do it in asia um yet uh at the same time it's seeking to do that it's it's a beneficiary of these in, of the international order it continues to recognize that it is a beneficiary of the international order which is why it continues to argue for supporting institutions like the united nations wto and so on and so forth yet it seeks to change them uh to serve its own interest to create that favorable external environment um, and that's the sort of contradiction in its policy, which creates greater friction and which eventually leads to sort of outcomes where we are now seeing the world sort of pushing back, or at least the West and America in particular, but even other countries, pushing back on Chinese diplomacy also at international organizations. Um, and I think that's an interesting contradiction to keep in mind from, a, from, from an Indian point of view also, given that India would also like to see uh, the international order revised uh, not necessarily thrown overthrown but revised certainly to suit its own interests um in terms of foreign policy the broad objective that the report talks about and i agree with all of this that the report is talking about right the, the, the creating this community of shared future for mankind is a broad objective again a very nebulous phrase used to mean many things 
um, it can mean something in public health. It can just like BRI. It's such a nebulous concept and phrase. It can actually end up meaning many things wherever you put it in whatever you want it to mean. Um, but in some sort of tangible areas, which again the report identifies and I agree with, um, is that it talks about China's major power diplomacy. That's been a key focus. Uh, of Xi Jinping's diplomacy, where he's talked about this idea of major power diplomacy. If you remember in 2013, his first summit meeting with Obama in Sunnylands, um, he sort of, the Chinese sort of proposed this framework in the context of a G2. Uh, but over time, it sort of evolved into much more than a G2. It's evolved into, uh, you know, beyond just how you engage with, say, in the US or Russia, but also in the context of how China broadly engages with the world. So yes, while it will support existing international institutions, it will also and it will seek to expand its stake in those institutions, uh, not just in terms of metrics of power, such as seats at different bodies and uh, leadership of different uh, agencies, but also in terms of normative concepts. Uh, the best example for this is human rights. Um, the fact that the Chinese have been competing vigorously to redefine uh, this universal notion of human rights to a far more particularistic notion which is determined by national conditions of each country uh, along with something to the effect of you know reshaping putting in development as a key component of human rights uh, and i presume that uh, by the time this pandemic is over the chinese would have also pushed very very hard which they're already doing to have health outcomes delivery as some component of human rights, given that that's one thing that they've been really uh, hitting the Americans hard with, uh, to, and also projecting their own strength in how they've managed COVID. Um, so I think those sort of the normative diplomacy, the power diplomacy is something that we need to keep in mind. Um, at the same time, there is obviously new multilateralism that the Chinese have sought to cultivate. Um, this is evident in the form of, say, institutions like FOCAC, institutions, uh, you know, the sort of BRICS, uh, AIIB, which is a new institution, um, uh, groupings like China Latin America Cooperation, the 17 plus one with Eastern Europe. The idea that China as a monolith, as a, as a single power, can deal with these groups of countries uh, in different parts of the world uh, under sort of certain institutional agreement arrangements. Um, I mean, that's again something that they've tried to create, uh, and they've sort of managed to uh, cultivate enough clout and power with through each of these arrangements to be able to influence decisions in different parts of the world. Uh, again, classic example throughout this pandemic. Uh, when China passed the national security law in Hong Kong, you ended up seeing something to the effect of uh, these groupings being used to legitimize that decision that the Chinese government had taken. So the African countries in the meeting of in the China Africa Solidarity Summit would sort of subscribe to you know a respect of your internal sort of internal sort of issues, uh, sort of keeping away from your internal affairs, respect for sovereignty, and even expressly going and endorsing that we agree with China's actions in Hong Kong. Uh, so I think that's important in terms of how they've leveraged those different uh, agencies and mechanisms that they've set up. Um, the other important thing that this major power diplomacy tells you is that from a Chinese perspective, um, power is the central currency in international affairs. And these are sort of instruments that are cultivated to exercise that power. Um, why do I say that? It's because China then therefore looks at the world in different sort of power dynamics based on different countries' capacity, power capabilities that it defines. So therefore it defines major powers as Russia, the US and the European Union. It defines peripheral powers as regions in its periphery. It looks at certain middle powers uh, or neighborhood diplomacy, which is, which is where usually Japan and India sort of fall in neighborhood diplomacy. Um, on occasion, you've heard the foreign minister talk about India as a major power, uh, but that has been the rare sort of occasion. Predominantly, it falls within the broader neighborhood diplomacy of China. And like I said, from neighborhood, then you come closer down to periphery. Um, and you're defining power based on geography, based on proximity, but also based on certain metrics of national power, which obviously we don't know. Uh, what those are. Uh, for example, how do you define European Union as a power as opposed to say Germany or France or Britain, uh, although Britain is no longer part of the EU. But that's the idea. Yet what it tells us is that the, from the perspective of the party, power is a central currency in international affairs. And I think that's important for India to keep in mind as we 
talk to the Chinese and as we've continued to talk to the Chinese. Um, I've spoken about this already. Revisionism doesn't necessarily entail overturning the system. It actually entails a mix of both. It entails being a stakeholder in some ways and expanding your stake while also cultivating new levels of power. And through all of this, of course, you expand, you envision a greater role for the PLA because if you're going to be taking a far more uh, global role um, and your interests are going to expand sooner or later, where your merchant ships will go, your uh, naval vessels will also follow. It's uh, part of how this is going to happen. Um, and I think there is a recognition of that. And therefore, uh, as I come forward to the defense white papers, you'll see that that sort of recognition is played out. In terms of its global vision, right? I mean, if you go back to 2004, and this is what the DOD report also mentions, and again, I agree with it. Um, 2004 is where Hu Jintao talks about new historic missions. He talks about moving from just a big, from offshore waters defense to not just offshore waters defense, but also open seas protection. Uh, in, along with that, there is a focus on uh, non-war military activities. This is where China sort of starts to look at, uh, you know, humanitarian or disaster relief operations, uh, anti-piracy, and so on and so forth. And of course, in 2008 is when those anti-piracy operations begin. Um, and since then, obviously, the Chinese have sort of sought to publicize those as a significant achievement. Uh, but along with that, of course, also peacekeeping operations under the UN. Again, this just about a week or so ago, the 10 days ago, the Chinese issued a white paper on their uh, peacekeeping operations. Uh, and also, if you this report also gives you data, which I'm trying to just sort of figure out what exactly what was. But uh, in terms of uh, its contributions to the UN, so China is the second largest contributor to the UN peacekeeping force in terms of the P5. Uh, it's also funded about 15% of uh, the total UN peacekeeping budget in 2019. That's an increase uh, from 10%, 10.2% of the budget in 2018. So within a year, there was a significant increase in world spending. Xi Jinping has also promised a release, uh, a reserve force that he's sort of set up for UN peacekeeping operations. Again, something that's important to keep in mind. The report also documents expanding bilateral and multilateral drills the Chinese are part of with a diverse set of nations. Um, of course, the purpose of all of this is to build combat experience, build networks, uh, uh, learn from other, other forces, also terrain familiarization, combat familiarization, and importantly, normalizing the PLA's presence in different areas uh, where it has generally not been present. Uh, which is a critical aspect of it. I mean, increasingly these port calls that happen in the Indian Ocean region, gradually they sort of normalize the presence of say Chinese submarines or Chinese vessels in that region. And that eventually sort of then becomes, then the conversation shifts from, well, why, why is this happening to how do we accommodate? Um, and I think that's the objective uh, that the PLA at the moment is essentially looking at in the short term, um, in terms of how to come to a point where it is a fait accompli for countries to accommodate our presence in the region. Uh, and once our presence is accommodated, then we can obviously do much more than what we uh, are doing currently. And lastly, of course, essentially soft power, uh, cultivate this sense of soft power. I mean, the terrible movie Wolf Warrior uh, attempted to sort of do this, at least the second Wolf Warrior attempted to sort of do this, where it, you know, uh, it learned from Hollywood uh, to create uh, terrible movies about uh, the morality of uh, your own armed forces. Um, but that's sort of something to take away in terms of how this is happening. Um, assessment of forces, and I thought this was really, really interesting in terms of how the forces have developed under this policy. So the paper quite uh, clearly argues that uh, the PLA Navy has the most experience operating abroad, which is not surprising. Uh, the Air Force may have the most experience in conducting uh, HADR operations abroad, uh, which is again an interesting point to keep in mind uh, that it's not just the Navy, but it's also other forces which are doing these things. Um, the PLA ground forces, the army, uh, has the most experience in conducting peacekeeping operations. Uh, most of, a significant number of these is obviously in Africa. Um, and lastly, this is again an interesting data point from the report, which is about the strategic support force running tracking telemetry and command stations in Namibia, Pakistan, and Argentina. This hasn't been really covered as significantly. The SSF is really quite uh, uh, a in some ways quite a shadowy sort of agency it's we're, we're very unclear about the number of uh, people employed within the SS, ssf uh, we have this broad structure of what it's supposed to do uh, yet its capabilities are obviously 
very the research on it is extremely uh, nascent, uh, and there's very little information in terms of what it does. So this is, again is something which is interesting in terms of how it's developed. Um, and again, uh, this has an important sort of uh, component from an Indian perspective, given that in the last couple of months we've heard about, you know, uh, narratives and fake news and bot activity and social media activity and so on and so forth emerging from Pakistan uh, with regard to India and China's conflict. So again, something important for us to keep in mind. Um, further, in terms of its global evolution, you see that the Defense White Paper of 2019 calls for uh, effectively protecting security and legitimate interests of overseas, overseas Chinese people and organizations and institutions. It also adds that to address these deficiencies, China will seek to build uh, Farsi forces and also overseas logistical facilities. So it's not like they aren't telling us what they really want to do. Uh, this is quoted verbatim from the Defense White Paper. Um, in this context, of course, this report currently talks about uh, the DoD report highlights these countries as to where China has likely considered bases. Now, to me, this is uh, it's wonderful that they have probably likely considered these bases. Uh, what is the, you know, how realistic are such considerations is another matter altogether. Uh, and uh, the other thing to keep in mind is, would China need so many bases? Uh, I think this is an interesting sort of thing for us to keep in mind. I mean, I, I was in a conversation yesterday with uh, uh, the former Foreign Secretary Vijay Gokhale, and he was talking about the, you know, would you need a base in the Indian Ocean in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan, and also in Myanmar? Uh, would you really need that? Or maybe let's say Thailand, which then sort of cuts into this place? Probably not. Uh, do you need all this? No. You may need one. You may need two at the max, depending on what your objectives are. But again, the, uh, this, the idea that this report also sort of implicitly argues for is about uh, it links BRI to all of this in the idea that debt places China in a position to acquire these bases. I am somebody who's a little skeptical about that idea. It's not as easy as place countries under deep debt and take away their ports and so, so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, and Sri Lanka is a case in point that it's not as easy to do that and it's not as easy to then militarize that or get it ready for military operations. Uh, yet, uh, I think it's safe to assume that over the next 10 years, we will see a Chinese logistics facility uh, in the Indian Ocean, most likely in Pakistan. Um, but that is likely to take place uh, irrespective. And there's some of the work for that is already being done. Uh, the report doesn't talk about it, but if you look at uh, Chinese naval uh, sales, uh, to these countries, its port development, capacity of port development. It allows these facilities to be used for dual use purposes, but would these be hard bases? Would there be some sort of soft basing? Uh, those are the kind of things that we need to look at. Uh, to me, some of this is partly also to kickstart uh, an American response, but that's just me being cynical and skeptical. Um, in terms of technology, which is the last aspect that I want to focus on, and I'll spend some time on this, um, the report talks about the long-term goal of creating an entirely self-reliant defense industrial sector fused with a strong civilian industrial and technology sector. Um, to me, I think this sort of misses in some ways the broader objectives. Uh, it's not just about creating that sector, it's about what you're going to do with it or what your objective is to do with it. To me, this is a means as opposed to an end, but this is how the report describes the strategic objective and long-term goal, I don't agree with it. Uh, to me, the objectives are far different. They are about offsetting the West's technological advantage militarily. They are about avoiding a technological surprise, uh, which then uh, adversely impacts uh, China's broader security environment. They are about also identifying areas where you can leapfrog the West, uh, given China's developing and evolving industrial base and innovation base. And finally, this sort of nebulous idea of a all-round world-class force. Um, and like I said, intelligent, intelligent operations is critical to this idea, although there may be many other things, right? I mean, there is no real clearly defined metrics of what one would call. But the ability to be able to perhaps compete with the US in far-flung theaters would probably be a marker of where you've come of this sort of world-class force marker. Um, but to me, therefore, this as the report defines it, doesn't necessarily uh, satisfy uh, 
the, the, the concept of an objective or a long-term goal to me, these are sort of actually what they're looking at. How the report talks about how they've gone about this, uh, and some of this is perfectly on point. It talks about the 13th five-year plan identifying key defense industries on reform. This is a huge sort of set of industry that the 13th five-year plan sort of identified. It goes from things like you know, aerospace engines, gas turbines, quantum communication, you know, electron, innovative electronics and software, robotics, and so on and so forth, artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth. Um, and the idea was therefore to develop your capacities in these large range of areas so that you can then leverage them for military purposes, which is where the sort of military uh, civil infusion comes into place, the MCF strategy. Um, it's not mentioned here, but the MCF strategy essentially was lifted to a, the program of military uh, civil infusion was lifted to uh, a national strategy in 2015. Um, in 2017, then here I've mentioned this year, you created the Central Commission for Integrated Military and Civilian Development, which Xi Jinping chairs. Um, uh, this sort of tried to create uh, far more tangible policy measures. And I'll talk about some of those uh, going forward. But yeah, but subsequently in 2016, you had a new science and technology commission within the uh, Central Military Commission, which was established. The purpose of this was to identify areas in which technology can be leveraged to for military advancements also, uh, and therefore guide development of those areas, uh, not just development in terms of tangible products, but also research, study, uh, doctrinal work in those areas. Uh, in 2017, you then had the Scientific Research and Steering Committee. This was specifically to guide research uh, and innovation with military applications. It's important because this sort of identifies, this sort of lays down areas in which you can actually build networks between different, uh, you know, uh, private companies, uh, research institutions, whether they are armed forces, research institutions or not, uh, to be able to then create products. Um, and finally, obviously, your sort of key institutions, the AMS, uh, NDU, uh, National University of Defense Technology, these were sort of, there were changes made within them to focus on key areas of technology that uh, need to be worked upon. So, for example, AMS does a lot of work on, uh, you know, doctrinal work in terms of how to look at, along with also specific different areas. But a key component of uh, the Academy of Military Sciences work is to look at doctrinal work, say, with regard to artificial intelligence. Um, so that was the sort of, pathway where they started developing. In terms of tangible measures, what we saw was that uh, there were many top level plans to guide industrial development. I'm going to do a brief case study on AI. So I'll just give you an example. So this is an example of the number of plans that were uh, put together, which sort of talked about AI becoming important and it went from far more general plans to specific plans. The same is the case with say 5G. Uh, when it started from a general vision across the range of sectors to then sort of far more specific vision. Um, this planning has its own problems, which I'll come to later, uh, which can be, which as this AI case study that I'll present can sort of, you can extrapolate from that for other uh, areas also. But uh, the idea then was to also cultivate uh, national champions. And in AI, you will see in my case study, how they've done that with AI, uh, guide research and commercialization of technologies, establish common standards. This came under the MCF. So, uh, you know, so for example, on shipbuilding, there were common standards that were identified on transport vehicles. There were common standards on certain kinds of vehicles. Uh, in terms of technology, they've tried to develop common standards where you can, you can use civilian technology development for military purposes. Think of this in the context of computer vision technology where, uh, you know, and used in say autonomous vehicles uh, or other areas. And that's where you sort of set common standards so that you can leverage civilian development also. Um, legislative changes were then specifically brought in place to enforce that. You know, one example of this is a 2016 uh, defense transportation law, which clarified that, you know, there are these common standards that non-state owned companies also have to follow for ships and other trans uh, transportation uh, so that they can at any point of time be uh, leveraged for military purposes. And this often happens in the border areas also from what I understand, uh, where, you know, uh, for troop transportation or things like that, you need vehicles and civilian vehicles can then be used. Often it is extremely, the outcomes of this have been extremely suboptimal. Independent research has shown that outcomes of all of this has been extremely suboptimal. You don't necessarily end up having those kind of vehicles and tools available. Yet the effort is to go in that direction. 
and that's something to keep in mind uh, with transportation being one node but i think more importantly with sort of more much more advanced technologies with ai and so on and so forth that's something to keep in mind um with that i'm going to go to my final bit uh, after this slide uh, this is what the report identifies uh, in terms of different areas where work is being done uh, and uh, where advancements have been made or at least where you're looking at what purposes to but we are looking to cultivate or develop certain technologies for what purposes and i think this is a really good section of the report it talks quite specifically about these areas and i think this is important from for us to keep in mind also to understand the weaknesses that can be leveraged one classic area is obviously this uh, you know semiconductors and we are seeing this as part of the china us competition but again in ai in quantum technologies there is an argument to be made that china has made significant strides um you know likewise in sort of hypersonics and things like that the china has made significant strides and given the focus it will continue to develop quite significantly in these areas in terms of uh, artificial intelligence i just want to go through a quick case study uh, maybe take five odd minutes and then i can wrap up um this is uh, not so the report has a special section on on intelligentization yet it's only about a page and a half and it only talks about it from a very superficial level um to me this is an important area for us also to look at because it can these are the kind of uh, things that we will start to encounter if not having already encountered and this is also areas which can give us options for asymmetric uh, countering of chinese uh, military presence um so how do the chinese think in terms of how ai can help the pla it can do this bunch of different things that i've listed down here uh, not just improve systems warfare capabilities by undermining enemy systems but also command your own support your own command systems enhance your own decision making improve pace of decision making and quality of decision making um of course all of these are uh, the fact that uh ai is still at a very nascent stage tells you that this is not necessarily happening at the moment it would be scary if somebody will be entirely reliant on ai for decision making yet as uh, data processing capacities go up uh and uh, it it can it will be heading to a space where increasingly we will rely more on you know uh, decisions that machines are decision options at least that machines are sharing with us and i think the chinese have recognized this over a period of time um and they're specifically moving in that direction yet there is a lot of work going on in terms of doctrinally how do you integrate this into your decision making apparatus um building smarter weapons provide new tools for asymmetric warfare your drone swarms and things like that which could be uh, you know cheaper when it comes to say Ha, more high end sort of american weaponry uh, enrich military deductions to be able to gather terrain data and a bunch of different terrain weather uh, you know deployment so on so forth and to be able to deduce what key you can do better again looking much looking forward uh, improve your logistics and planning and boost cyber security and obviously you can do all this by leveraging civilian development um the chinese have rightly identified a bunch of different vectors for this uh, and i think this is where you then see institutional reform going on which i'll sort of show you a little bit in a very messy graph uh, which i've drawn from different bits of research um, but yeah there are different vectors through which they've invested and they've done that if uh, so right now for example in rules and laws you've got a uh, autonomous vehicle demonstration zone in beijing which is very very large uh and that's just been cleared a couple of weeks ago which just tells you that they are moving quite rapidly in this area uh and then you think about autonomous vehicles possibly being used far more in hostile terrains on the border with india um that's an example of where this can actually impact us um leveraging the commercial environment researching on core technologies and trying to create your own sort of innovations data a big advantage but also a disadvantage because data for commercial applications is one thing but data for military use is completely different uh, and what would be even good data when it comes to devising military ai is something that even they are grappling with um cultivating r and d links and so on and so forth and identifying talent that you can actually do and in this sense i think covid has been a beneficial thing for the pla because covid reduced private sector strength uh, even in china uh, and it allowed these far more educated people the opportunity so it allows the pla to tap into far more educated people who will look for stable employment whereas 
you know, a year and a half ago with Tencent, Alibaba, whatever, and the rest of them, the entire ecosystem being far stronger, um, they, the PLA had to compete with these really solid paying private sector entities. So I think that's another thing to keep in mind that, you know, there can be benefits to uh, what appear to be uh, tragedies in some ways. Uh, and from the PLA's point of view, to me, this has been an actual benefit. And I think we will see the outcomes of that uh, by the by the time the sort of uh, recruitment takes place this year. I think it's already taking place this year right now in August and September is when it happens. But uh, we'll see the benefits of this as in terms of if the details come out in terms of whom they are hiring. Um, in terms of what have they done? So I spoke about national champions. Well, they initially had four national champions. Now they had 15 national champions. These Each of these companies have been given specific sectors to work on. They've identified 17 priorities, priority areas which are being supported by funding. Um, when, a central government in China, when the central government in China creates plans, it percolates to local levels. Uh, local governments start to create their own plans and set their own targets for achievement. Uh, in terms of uh, which not which don't necessarily align with the central government's targets, which tend to usually supersede the central government's target. So, for example, in the case of AI, if you actually see China's total market capital target for AI, what you will see is that if you put together the local plans on AI, so Anhui's plan uh, or say Shanghai's plan uh, or Fujian's plan, Hebei's plan, if you put all of that together, what you end up seeing is that it actually exceeds the total market value that the government the central government identified say if it identified 100 billion uh, by 2020 as a market value for ai specific industries the local plans cumulatively identified as 430 billion so there's a huge mismatch which and that tells you a little bit about how the incentives work out uh, because lots of private money flows into it, tremendous corruption takes place lots of things which are not even ai become ai um, and you end up getting suboptimal outcomes in terms of your final products. But what you also get is that you very rapidly increase uh, the base and scale, uh, which you can then improve quality. Uh, so at the moment, the focus is on quantity and subsequently it will move towards quality. Um, in terms of publications and patents, all that has sort of gone up over the last few years and a lot to do with how the government is focused on it. Um, there is AI focused education and military training that has happened. Um, R&D expenditure across the board in China has risen and continues to rise. There's been increased investments in integrated circuits. Uh, and yet, they are still far away to catching up from this as we see in the contest with the US. There's a large commercial ecosystem which the state can leverage and which the PLA can leverage and is leveraging. Um, and again, data and device and regulatory frameworks, I give you the example of the Beijing uh, autonomous vehicle base. Um, a sense of where Chinese AI companies are working on. This is largely commercial companies. And it tells you a little bit about uh, a lot of the sort of areas they're working on can be critical for military applications. So autonomous vehicles, chips as a whole, um, but things like voice recognition, uh, things like computer vision, all of these can be Internet of Things, robotics, all of these can be very, very useful for military applications. Um, and this is where money is essentially going uh, in China's AI development. Even education can be critical for military applications. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, this is that large plan in terms of how they have started doing things. Uh, it's a little difficult to read, so I can, I'm happy to share it with you. Um, but if you look at it, it'll tell you what specific in, uh, organizations are doing. So, for example, National Defense University or NUDT, what AMS is doing, uh, what are the different branches in them and what they're doing uh, with regard to furthering sort of military applications of AI. And this is, a pos this is possible because the way the central government is sort of sought to consciously go after the development of these areas. Um, some examples, uh, we've seen drone technology. Uh, again, always take we always take what they put out with a pinch of, uh, more than just a pinch of salt. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that there is a development that is happening in the civilian sector, such as this, this light show, uh, which is uh, you know purportedly done by autonomous uh, vehicles, uh, UAVs. And this can be used uh, for military purposes also for swarm technologies. And then the Chinese have sort of worked, uh, they've consciously worked towards developing these capacities, uh, seeing them as low cost yet high impact opportunities. Another thing, like I spoke about, is that uh, uh, you know while we take things with a pinch of salt, it's important to keep in mind that not everything is, uh, you know, propaganda is not entirely 
not fact based uh, so for example here is an example of chinese computer vision facial recognition companies essentially winning uh, uh, competitions run by the us department of commerce um, so it tells you that this is not just myth there is fact behind this myth also uh, and we've seen the application of some of these technologies obviously domestically say in xinjiang or other places um, this is a case where you know uh, for the last couple of years uh, there have been integrated uh, exercises uh, with Chinese uh, soldiers uh, combat combating AI opponents. Uh, and I think this opponent is called Prophet 1. Uh, so this is the case of the Prophet 1 opponent and then there has been Prophet 2 and so on and so forth. And these exercises uh, essentially are aimed at, uh, again, you being able to use AI to be able to train your forces uh, in terms of systems warfare. And I think, again, something important to keep in mind. Of course, all of this has constraints. None of this is, again, covered in that DOD report, but important for us to know. Um, AI has its own challenges. There's an issue of strategic culture as to how uh, a force adapts to these new technologies. And China actually specifically has been struggling with this. Uh, and unless you get newer recruits who are educated who can actually adapt to this technology, it's going to be a challenge. Um, core technologies, semiconductors, China imports about 300 billion worth of this. Uh, there's a significant talent shortage, not just in China, but around the world. But if you're looking specifically to cultivate, uh, you know, this is an area you are going to struggle with it. Can you be an attractive talent destination? Increasingly, it looks like no. Um, so that's going to be a problem for them. Um, the problem of command innovation in, in the political economy of China, where I've spoken about uh, how you end up creating scale and capacity, yet poor quality. Finally, again, military data limitations I've spoken about, what can be effective data. And of course, all of this put in the context of this broad geopolitical competition uh, is something that we in India need to keep in mind that this will create limits to whatever the Chinese are saying that they're doing um, because of this because of their increasing dependence on foreign supply chains when it comes to technology also, not just in terms of uh, you know technology theft and so on, but also just supply chains naturally. Uh, and that's going to be a problem also for them going forward. With that, I will wrap uh, and I'll let Suyash uh, go forward with this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manoj. Yeah, over to you, Mr. Suyash. I'll just share my screen. Uh, is my screen visible now? Yes, it's perfect. Is it visible? Yes, yeah. perfect. Okay. Uh, so my presentation, uh, so Manoj has covered a lot of ground uh, from strategic to uh, tactical to applications in AI. I will focus on the tactical aspect. I'll start from strategy and then I'll focus on the tactical aspects of the report and then plug in our research that Manoj and I are doing on these aspects. Uh, I'd like to just make a brief comment on uh, what Commodore, uh, Commodore Vasan said. Uh, he said that tactic, uh, strategic direction and quantity of vessel. The quantity of vessel cannot be measured in absolute terms because there are many multiple factors involved. Uh, and strategic direction, the number of times Taiwan, India are repeated. Uh, the number of times these countries were mentioned in the report indicates uh, the strategic direction in which China is going. Uh, if you see the latest strategic direction, which Professor Frevel, talk, uh, Professor Frevel talks about, it has said the first strategic direction starts with Taiwan. Then the secondary strategic direction is India and other aspects like South China Sea, which is clearly coming out in this report uh, on the basis of number of uh, number of mentions or importance given to these countries. Uh, in terms of quantity, in terms of quantity, yes, uh, PLA is the largest, PLA Navy is the having is having uh, the largest fleet right now. But uh, I agree with uh, Manoj uh, and uh, Commodore Wasson what he said that uh, it, the deployability cannot be deployability is a challenge for China because there are multiple theaters in which they are being they have to deploy and come count. Factoring geographical challenges could be a factor going ahead. Uh, for the scope, this, for this presentation, the scope of my uh, the scope is uh, I'll start from PLA's 2020 goals. Why this report is report is very important, and what are the goals that they are trying to achieve? Uh, I'll deep dive into military modernization. What is the military modernization that has happened? And especially, there are few important aspects that have happened over uh, past one year. I'll briefly touch upon uh, nuclear deterrence that the PLA is trying to do that the, that China is trying to do through PLA. 
training is another another most important part i think that has been played out uh, in the past 4 5 years the way training structures and regimes have changed which is helping pla and uh, aiming or achieve or uh, moderating their weaknesses and apart from all these things what are still the most important weaknesses that other countries are looking to or could look to exploit for the pla uh, there is a disclaimer that uh, as commodore wasan has already pointed out uh, that this is a pre covid report the cut off for this report was 31st december so all of these calculation doesn't factor in uh, changes that have happened post the COVID, outbreak of covid pandemic uh, so change uh, it's china's assertiveness on east uh south china sea uh japan india line of actual control all this has not been all this factors have not been factored in and that is why uh, it will next report is equally going to be important uh why is this report most okay to start with this is the longest there have been 20 uh, dod reports but this is the longest report uh, it is almost over 200 pages which tells you that uh, the nature and the change of the nature of the threat that uh, china's uh, nature of the threat that china portrays which is uh, anticipated by this regime uh, it actually mentions mark experts uh, views about this how he has conceptualized this report and what what kind of threat or a, what kind of strategic mindset has been applied for uh, considering china as a threat why is this report important because this report marks a important deadline for pla's objective for the first objective was mechanization for which the deadline was 2020 uh, the report and previously before the report the defense white paper categorically say, says that say that uh, this uh, the mechanization deadline has not been achieved it has been delayed mechanization was supposed to happen in three phases first two phases have already been achieved uh, third phase it is delayed and they are planning to achieve it by 2022 which happens to be next party congress also it happens to be the centenary for ccp but that deadline will also 2021 happens to be the centenary for ccp the deadline will also be most likely missed so the next deadline not factoring in the covid pandemic uh, to achieve mechanization is 2020 uh, 2022 uh, just a brief note i'm sure all of us are aware of this a brief note of what is the difference between mechanized and motorized uh, forces mechanized is where a ground unit can fight from vehicle motorized is when uh, a ground unit can carry loads with the vehicle but then they have to disassemble it or uh, use different things to fight for example bofors is a example of motorized force china's current pcl 8181 is an example of mechanized force uh, china is india is currently is a mixed bag of mechanized plus motorized china is trying to move from motorized to mechanized which was the first deadline for 2020 uh, that's next deadline actually their next deadline was not 2035 but uh, the report says their next deadline was 2050 which was to convert it into a world class army but the gap but the explanation given uh, for the 2035 deadline which is informatization and intelligentization is because the gap between the two deadlines is extreme 30 years is not a great gap and that is why uh, the regime anticipated that there should be an interim deadline to achieve informatization and intelligentization by 2035 uh, all these deadlines as we all know were mentioned in the 7 2017 party congress where she said that uh, mechanization should be done by 2020 informatization by 2035 and to be one of the world class armies by 2050 uh so this now deep diving into the report uh, there are the report categorically mentions that there are three areas uh, where the pla is ahead of us these three areas are ship building land based conventional ballistic and cruise missiles and integrated air defense systems in case of ship building we have we have seen over the last year in december if i'm not wrong uh, their second air, their first indigenous aircraft carrier and their second air, uh, a second aircraft carrier was rolled out it was put to waters and put to waters as in not for test but it became a part of navy also their first ambitious amphibious ship this early part of this year uh, was put to waters so uh, they are steadily building ships now the quality of ship their deployment geographical factors all this will be tested once only and only if a pla if the pla goes to war uh, so unless and until we cannot categorically comment on how these ships are 
uh, whether they are uh, what are the quality of ships how they will be deployed but yes they uh, if i remember the statistics correctly they from 2014 or 2015 to 2020 the rate of delivery is 2.8 vessels per year which is a big ask uh, it's also in case of submarines uh, china the second point is land based conventional ballistic and cruise missiles uh, if you uh, if we study pla rocket forces their major emphasis from the founding itself previously the second artillery corps is on land based weapon uh, subsequently development the development started in uh, water leg as well and uh, in the air leg but there the pla for conventional as well as nuclear forces their thrust is the land based uh, weapon initially in silos now movable weapons uh, the report claims that china has already overtaken land based uh, in quantity and quality us in quantity and quality in case of land based conventional ballistic missiles uh, in case of cruise missiles uh, this the report claims or uh, the report claims that they are, they they are developing cruise missiles and some of the western analysts have claimed that they are also developing uh, so for example the df17 is one of the important cruise missile which can bear a nuclear payload but again these are uh, analysis done by western scholars there is no confirmation on this from china yet uh the third important point where you china has already overtaken the united states is integrated air defense system and this has already been proven that uh, s uh, russia's s system delivery is much better than thad uh, and that's why also india opted for it china has three tier three uh, tiers uh, way of looking at air defense system uh the first tier is their s400 s300 second is s400 and based on these they have also developed indigenous cap capabilities and uh, the report says that these capabilities are um, are making at this moment these capabilities are making them much more safer in case of integrated air defense uh at least in case of applying this at least in case of their a280 capabilities applying this this into their near seas would Uh, I, I would cause a uh, would cause some damage to the United States in case of a war in the near future. Uh, other areas which the report talks about where the China, where the People's Republic of People's Republic of China and the PLA are modernizing rapidly. Uh, newer and strategic vessels and aircraft. Again, this is from the defense white paper. If we if we go back a few years, the two thousand defense two thousand fifteen defense white paper. categorically mentioned that china should uh, change pla should change its mentality and look at near seas and broad uh, far away seas uh, uh, for their for protecting its interest this implies uh, they should develop a better way of uh, a modern navy and a strategic air force this was the directive that was been mentioned in the 2015 defense white paper and if we break down the number and if we break down uh, the the development or modernization that has happened since 2012 13 uh, this has been the case uh, pla after uh, 2013 14 since since xi jinping took over has started building longer vessels has started chucking out their fleet for making room for uh, third fourth 4.5 fifth generation aircraft uh, their reforms also include uh taking all their air bases to the center for example the western theater command's air base was moved to central theater command for providing them a long range for testing their long range capabilities so their force modernization force development is steadily parallel to what was being said in 2015 defense white paper uh so manoj and i are working on one paper where we are trying to put out empirical data proving this hypothesis but uh, it is still under way but from that what i can tell you is uh, their force development has been very much in sync with what they have said in 2015 uh, it is a different matter or it's a different aspect whether they are able to complete it or they are completed it is or not but it is it is steadily in sync with what they have said in 2015 second important point where pla is modernizing rapidly is the way they are communicating so for example uh, the after 2015 reforms uh the uh when theater commands were from when they moved from the mr system to theater command system a lot of problem or glitch glitches were observed in case of communication 
communication can be from the cmc to theater or from one theater to other theater in case of multi theater contingencies they are addressing the issue they are addressing the horizontal issues but multi theater contingency is still a problem because the communication direct doesn't happen from one theater to other theater it goes from one theater to cmc to other theater so that is still a problem but yes they have, they have fairly uh, worked out a modus operandi on how communication will happen in case of escalation so in case of an es in case of escalation the theater command head would be the chief operating officer and would be directly reporting to the cmc and the roles of uh, service heads would be below or in the hierarchy it would be lesser than that of theater command so the horizontal communication is one of the strength uh, that they are dev they have developed they are still working on uh, vertical uh, so they are the, they are still working on horizontal communication third important aspect that the pa that this report talks about is uh, amphibious capabilities and that is directly linking to what commodore wasson said in case of taiwan um, largely their amphibious capabilities are directed towards taiwan and south china sea and looking at how they are developing their amphibious capabilities which also includes marine core uh, largely uh, tells us that they are looking at their first strategic direction or their developments are based on achieving their first strategic direction whether this will work or not is a different case but at least deterrence has been established credible deterrence that this uh, and a uh, will to do so has been established through their force modernization uh, the scope another important point is marine core when it was formed uh, and placed in djibouti and across three fleets it was it had a limited role now this report claims that the role of pla marine core and the scope and size has increased drastically uh, initially they were responsible for only offensive action now they are also responsible for offensive action supporting other forces and defensive action for strategic installments of china uh, so this has been the increase of scope their size has also increased so initially it was 20000 uh, 20000 troops now the paper claims it's around 30 to 50000 it's fluctuating from 30 to 50000 troops and increasing so this is another important point uh, a progress a progress point that the pla has made in past two years uh, there as manoj has already pointed out, pointed out uh, there has been improvement in unconventional sector we should not really call them unconventional but uh, assuming that uh, the three forces are conventional and these are unconventional there has been a massive improvement in unconventional sector that is cyber space and ew and all this comes under the for, uh, all this comes under the uh, under the jurisdiction of pla ssf that is strategic support force yes there are a lot of ambiguities uh, of uh, the other countries have no idea i have very limited ideas on what this force is how it entails and i have a broad broad eye view of how this force works but it is a really a black box for other country another important development which i'll come to it later its capabilities in high altitude warfare a uh, lot of media reporting this time uh, when the since the doka since the lsc stand off that uh, stand off started is regarding indian forces being much more experienced uh, in uh, fighting in mountainous warfare agreed that is a point point well taken but the capabilities deployment that has happened uh, capabilities development not deployment sorry development that has happened since 2017 especially after uh, doklam stand off and deployment that has happened since 2019 gives another picture so the picture is that they are equivalently prepared uh, so capabilities like uh, lightest tank in the world pca lightest howitzers uh, tibet centric helicopters all this has a uh, start all this uh, manufacturing for this and commissioning started in 2017 after the doklam stand off and the latest stratford report claims that this all were deployed in 2019 which gives a very different picture on on what is the reality uh, and most importantly the role of glsf that is their third uh, so after 2015 reforms three important three newer forces were commissioned first uh, ssf which is their cyber and space force uh, second one is uh, the second artillery corps was converted given a full status to uh, rocket force and third one is glsf sf that is logistics force uh the role of logistics the, the, the uh, this force was untested until wuhan and the recent floods 
and after all the reporting that has happened okay most of it can be claiming too high but after all the things that they have achieved it can be very well said that they are making inroads into delivery of logistics uh, for the armed forces so this is another important aspect that other countries should focus on they are improving their uh, improving how china is improving their logistics delivery capabilities uh, there are a few service centric observations uh, that uh, this report makes and also other researches uh, have highlighted uh, in case of army for a lot for a lot of for 20 years now uh, the pla army is trying to uh, do brigadization and uh, develop combined armed brigades uh, it is not yet completely done but most of it 80 90% of brigadization has taken place there are 78 combined armed brigades and 15 special operational forces brigades uh, but it is still incomplete what brigade brigadization helps in making the force more agile also the uh, there has been a lot of staff cut that has happened this is the 11th time since xi jinping uh, this is the 11th time since 1949 and first time since xi jinping took over that a uh, lot of personnel were cut but we we don't it is a bit ambiguous because we don't know whether these uh, the personnel who were dropped were shifted to other uh, forces or whether they were dropped uh, or they were retired for example uh, manoj was talking about strategic support force what is the employability we uh, we can assume that uh, there has been a fresh recruitment has taken place but we can also we cannot completely disregard the fact that a lot of people who were chucked off from the armed forces were transferred to these forces so there is a complete ambiguity on this uh, another important aspect is navy navy is as i have already mentioned navy and air forces and pla air force are trying to uh, develop their fleet or modernize their fleet based on the directive and other forces and the last point in service specific observation is the role of rocket force and the conventional and deterrence uh, conventional and nuclear capabilities that they are developing which is developing ambiguity i'll come to that later um the next important point that this uh, report highlights is on nuclear force deterrence uh there are a few shocking i shouldn't say shocking there is at least one shocking observation but there are few important observation that this for uh, that this report of, uh, highlights uh first uh, i'll start from what this uh, report states uh, it reiterates the nfu part and two stated commitment one uh, no nuclear first use and second one no nuclear use against a country which doesn't have nuclear weapon even in case of second strike so these are the two important but these the report claims and other western scholars especially from mit like dr fiana cunningham has already claimed that newer developments like a uh, triad launch on warning and most importantly uh, ambiguity created due to uh, improved vessels improved uh, systems and uh, tactical nuclear weapons can seriously impact uh, china's no first use posture i'll explain each of them uh in case of uh china has uh, china's mating policy is very different than the rest of the world it is very similar to that of india where in peace time their missiles and their uh, warheads are kept separately uh and the mating time is 20 minutes in case of an escalation but when the triad becomes operational i think there has only been once that their one slbm was carrying nuclear missiles we don't uh, they were carrying ballistic missiles and nuclear warheads as a practice purpose which was uh, operational for 13 months when the nuclear tri- when the triad becomes operational uh, we we no country has idea how they would how they would keep their mating and missiles separate because for us uh, for a submarine in case of an escalation they have to mate their missiles and their warheads so this is a questionable part which china has no uh, china has not clearly talked about second one is the launch on warning capabilities uh, this has been uh, of all these factors low is the most uh, discussed factors within the western scholars as well as pla scholars also uh, in china itself a lot of hockey scholars are talking about a posture change from uh, from uh, may not mating to a uh, launch on warning system which would again impact a uh, uh, nfu if there is a false alarm uh, so this is again an important part that chinese scholars are discussing about on uh, this report categorically mentions uh, china uh, 
as developing tactic uh, as uh, they are developing tactical nuclear weapons uh, this uh, perhaps this is the uh, the rarest thing that this this is something new that this report talks about because we have never seen china developing tactical nuclear weapons they all and they have all uh, repeatedly from 1964 claimed that their weapons are strategic and only used for uh, nuclear deterrence but developing tactical nuclear weapons can seriously impact their no first use and strategic de deterrence posture their missile ambiguity is another important part where a lot of recent developments like df26 df21 can carry both conventional as well as a uh, nuclear payload and what if another country anticipates it to be different and this can be a questionable remark in, uh, so this will also impact their no first use uh, posture uh, and another important or a shocking claim that this report makes is the development of warhead all of us agree with the point that china has not stopped developing warheads or their payloads but this report and they have around 200 to 250 payloads but uh, which can range up to 300 but this report claims that in the next 5 years uh, the pay, the number of payloads will increase by at least will increase at least increase by 200 which is a tall claim that this report is making looking at the trajectory that has happened over the past 30 40 years the most important aspect of this report this report broadly highlights training but i find it a most important aspect in china's modernization uh, military modernization and changes that have happened in pla since 2050 which is regarding training uh, all of this has been a classic cliche that china has not gone to war from 1979 there are a lot of problems which is which are true uh, no one denies it but there are there uh, it's a classic academic cliche that uh, china has not gone to war there are peace disease peace time habits peace time problems uh, what is a peace time disease habit or problem it's a peace time approach for a soldier uh, which will come into training uh, or their recalcitrant this approach will spill over into training their recalcitrant attitude will spill over into training which will later impact in their uh, in case of a war this is how a lot of western scholars or indian scholars define uh, peace time have disease peace time habits peace time problems uh, this has also been pointed out by hu jintao in uh, 2006 she reiterated it in 2013 but she identified after the strategic assessment which led to reforms she identified an other few important areas apart from peace time disease and peace time habits which are responsible for pls uh, which were responsible for changes in the pla's training regime he also questioned the low role of leadership okay the role of leadership was also because uh, a lot of it went parallel to corruption that was happening and changes uh, in the leadership that she wanted to make but the justification given to uh, changes in the training regime was where uh, peace time habits and lack of credible leaders with the pla what were what were the steps that she uh, she is pla took to address this and a uh, lot of it has happened since 2016 17 and over a period of last 3 4 years uh, first one was the uh, this can be divided into two part first one is the organizational change and second one uh, force structure force changes or in or in case of organization as in larger pla the bureaucratic changes happened also in training gs their previous department which was in the cmc which was re responsible for training was chucked out and they have created a new department under the cmc which is which directly reports to xi jinping so uh, it can be claimed it can be safely claimed that she there is a there she is oversight over training also a newer uh, inspection teams and monitoring teams were commissioned uh, to provide critical assessment of training drills and military exercises which directly reported to she, which directly reports to she uh, earlier what used to happen is uh, training regularly happened and pla came out very successfully of these training drill, drills and regimes and there was no reporting regular institutionalized reporting that took place to cms now this has been institutionalized with an element of inspection teams which are directly be, uh, reporting to she these are the organizational level changes in case of force changes uh, 
one uh, important change that happened was institutionalization of permanent blue force in tried military exercise. Tried is a military exercise with uh, the PLA Army. It's an annual exercise. There was a the first uh, in blue force which was institutionalized was in the strike 2014. Okay, what is a blue force? Blue force is a replica of American army and PLA dem calls themselves uh, as a red force. And they are over the years they are made to train against each other in a realistic in a realistic condition and to test the assessment or combat readiness. What happened previously was PLA knew how uh, blue force are going to blue uh, replica of blue forces are going to function and they very conveniently won over those blue forces. Which also clear, which also says up something about their peacetime habits or peacetime attitudes. Now, with the institutionalization of permanent blue force in 2014, was permanent blue force in 2014, there was an element of surprise and rigor was increased. After 2014, it was subsequently blue forces were institutionalized in all forces, uh, all exercises across all services. I'll come to that later. But this institutionalization has made military exercises much more rigorous and much more challenging for the PLA. And, su and surprise, uh, not surprisingly, but over the years, there have been instances where P uh, Red Army, that is PLA, the training, the training force of the PLA, has lost on multiple occasions to the Blue Force after 2014, after institutionalization happens. Uh, these are some of the looking at what has happened as uh, how the this where uh, the armies were directed from training exercise to the border. These are on, on screen. The third point you can say the see there are some important uh, exercises that are to be noted, which are happening every year. In case of army, it's tried and firepower. In case of navy, is mobility. Uh, in case of air force, it's red force. Rocket forces is called heavenly sword. There is a uh, pap. There is an exercise guard for pap, and there is also an exercise for uh, logistics force, which is called missions. Apart from other exercises, which are, happens happens on ad hoc, other exercises that happen on ad hoc basis, these are the institutionalized exercises which happens every year. So these are something which everyone should be watchful for, considering what has happened recently in January two thousand twenty. Uh, I'll not talk about AI because uh, Manoj has already mentioned uh, a lot about AI. Uh, but just one thing, uh, PLA, uh, PLA. Strategic Support Force also started an exercise in 2017-18. Uh, in, initially, they did it on an ad hoc basis, but in 2017-18, they started an exercise called Exercise Chibing, uh, which is conducted every year. And again, there is a Blue Force replica institutionalized there. And surprisingly, a lot in a lot of cases, uh, PLA in SSF, PLA came out very well over the Blue Force, which is uh, which is an exception. Uh, considering other exercises. Uh, moving on from exercises, despite all the things that they have done uh, in case of reforms, restructuring, in case of exercises, in case of force development, training, they have also trained the number of training with uh, foreign forces has gone up tremendously. So there is a drastic paradigm change from when Mao said that we will not force, we will not train with the foreign army to where they are training right now with uh, all the armies in the region and extra regional forces. Despite all this, there are a multiple weaknesses uh, with the there are multiple weaknesses uh, within the PLA that the regime is also aware of. I can think of four major and five, uh, six, seven or eight minor uh, weaknesses. Four major peace disease, though a cliche is still a weakness because and we will not be able to deliberate on this unless and until PLA goes to war. There is a uh, Manoj has already mentioned this. There is a tremendous demand and supply mismatch. So modernization, force development, force capability upgrade has been happening since 2000 uh, and has escalated and has increased since 2008, 2000, and 2014. But the quality of personnel uh, is not matching up to the force development that has happened, especially in case of Navy, Air Force and Rocket Forces. We have no idea about what is happening in Strategic Support Force. It's a complete black box. And I am not I'm saying this based on empirical evidences that have been that are coming out in uh, PLA's newspaper, not only other Western scholars, but PLA themselves are repeated. PLA themselves is repeatedly claiming this to their newspapers. 
that uh, there is a tremendous demand and supply mismatch so much so that last in last october november uh, when their aircraft carriers were on was on the verge of being rolled out they had a uh, they had a several a severe shortage of people who could operate the aircraft carrier one and people who could operate the aircraft on this aircraft carrier and they had to go to other forces to develop to bring in, in to bring in that so these are some of the things that this is another major challenge that pla is facing that their modernization is not achieving, matching up to their recruitment they have made several recruitment changes in 2020 but then covid came in and that got uh, that got derailed which i am sure will happen in 2021 uh, we uh, manoj and i have, have done a paper i'll share that with you about the recruitment part uh, which we did in uh, a part of it talks about recruitment which we did in april uh, corruption do xi jinping addressed it uh, i think this is my personal be- uh, view based on some empirical evidence is that corruption has corruption has been partially addressed uh, corruption was a tool used for political for as a political uh, corruption was a poli- political tool it was used as a political tool and uh, uh, it helped she to to place uh, his loyal people to different different level yes corruption has been addressed but it has not completely addressed until yet and fourth expenditure this is before for covid expenditure was already a problem because china's economy has started to slow down and uh, expenditure was started to about started to flattening up this was pre covid post covid this is going to be another major challenge and also in case of expenditure uh, when you break down expenditure there is a cost uh, paid for developing uh, the force which is just one third of the total cost that the force that is required for maintenance of that force uh, for the past 15 years they are on a rapid spree of developing force but when the maintenance cost starts coming in it will be, it is going to impact the pla also uh, manoj i'm sure have has written a lot more on this about the uh, veterans part uh, a lot of demands like in india there were also demands in the uh, pla about the veterans part which led to a multiple multiple protests and finally uh, in finally commissioning of finally making of uh, their veterans affair department in 2018 so when uh, so generally uh, from 2000 uh, 19 white paper we can say that uh, 2019 white paper claims that the uh, uh, expenses are divided into three part modernization expense uh, the uh, this revenue expense revenue expenditure expense which is used for services and maintenance expense uh, from 2014 15 uh, the first part that is modernization expense is on 40% rest others are on 28 29% but this ratio will change once the other two starts factoring in and this is pre covid we have uh, certainly the situation is going to be grimmer for them post covid there are a few of there are a few minor tactic or uh, tactical weaknesses with pla as well these were the major weaknesses tactical weaknesses imply uh, first one their mid air and open seas their logistics though despite jlsf jlsf takes care of their logistics within and also has started looking into out body out logistics outside their boundary but their force capability itself is not supporting their logistics capability for example their mid air and open sea refueling system they don't have uh, enough to do that which severely impacts their ambition which was mentioned in 2015 white paper to operate overseas so this is a severe most important node that other countries could explore explore in the near term in the long term they are yes they are developing those capabilities but in the near term this is an important node uh, that can be explored uh, basing facilities this paper talks a lot about basing facilities uh, it has mentioned some 15 16 countries which could have potential pla bases but looking at what is happening right now uh, there are a very few countries which could be potential pla bases uh, pakistan cambodia is already assuming cambodia is already one i couldn't think of i could think of only two or three other countries which could be uh, pla bases in the future in the near term uh, still there is a lack of limited joint op capabilities so a lot of pla exercises that are taking place uh, internally or with outside forces it is individual service exercises so this is a weakness that has been identified 
uh, by the regime itself but they have not quite certainly worked on it uh, so for example army is training with army or army is training within itself there are a, a very few instances where army is training in navy which severely impacts their joint operational capabilities one exception to this was the recent thing that happened where they use where the recent thing that has happening in the past 6 7 months where they are using civilian contain containers for landing uh, in the south china sea and in east china sea so this more than uh, joint operation this uh, fun this comes from a broad category of civil military fusion or civil military integration back then but yes joint operation is still a uh, still an uh, challenge that the pla faces inter service joint operation um another important challenge is the lack of rotational capability which they have started addressing in past two years but it has been a norm in pla over a past so many over past 50 60 years that at a lower level lower to mid lower to mid upper level if a personnel starts in one theater command right now or previously one mr region then it it is most likely that he will end up in that region itself which severely impacts their functioning for example uh, in case of tibet uh, if it if if it if there needs to be a redeployment or uh, if there needs to be reinforcement then due to this uh, functioning reinforcement can could have been challenging in the past but could have been a challenge in the past but right now they are working on it and uh, this is a certain note that the pla has identified that uh, rotation should become more common at lower and mid lower level as well uh, multi theater operational capabilities are still limited uh, there is a over reliance on information system which can be exploited and uh, as in case of most of the armies in the world there is still rigidity uh, in personnel system which was faced when reform started so these are the uh, important minor tactical problems that uh, pla has apart from the major problems uh, what the last point as you can observe on the screen is what after she uh, that is why party congress is 2022 is very important i know 2017 uh, uh, she becoming permanent name in the constitution all that happened but there will be a day will she when she will go and someone else will replace so what would be the role of pla all the changes that have that has been done in the past 4 5 years how would that play out because most of the changes are uh, are assuming the they are assuming their loyalty to she how will this play out in future is an important thing that we all need to consider that what after she how will pla behave after she and that is why 20 what happens in 2022 party congress is extremely important Uh, there are a few parting shots regarding this report uh, this report is a change from uh, this report is an aberration from what has been happening from past 20 years why do i say that because of the extra emphasis that has been played out and which uh, reiterates the importance china is occupying in this administration and especially it is defense minister and state uh, foreign ministers uh, vision or uh, this next report is going to be even more important than this report because of the things that china has done since december starting with indonesia uh, until up till india uh, so i think with indonesia every uh, every with every country in the east east china sea and the south china sea and on its lac uh, again this report the next report would be important because of their india centric deployment uh, india centric also india centric development which has happened since 2017 and deployment which has happened since 2019 i am sure our next next report will focus on that also uh, this report broadly speaks about two important developments uh, that is j20s and s su 35s uh, it is important to note that uh, despite multiple media reports j20 a limited i think only two j20s which are their uh, latest version which are their uh, primest or the most optimum version of the uh, air force are not deployed on the indian border uh, the first full size uh, j20 uh, brigade was commissioned in for their taiwan force which is with their for their taiwan contingency which is with their eastern theater command they also imported a lot of 
uh, S Sukhoi 35s, which are also placed with the south uh, with their southern uh, theater command, which is for the South China Sea, and uh, so they are not yet deployed on the Indian force on the Indian borders. And finally, the most important, as Manoj has already pointed out, some of the claims, despite all of this, are very tall. Uh, but uh, clearly, we can understand why these claims are made. That's because of the awareness that, the, that this report creates within the policymakers in the US and also uh, uh, with the policymakers across the world. So that was the reason, and also for budgets, I'm sure. This was the important. This, these were the important reasons for which uh, such tall claims were made in this report. But yes, so, uh, for example, in case of tactical nuclear weapons, it was a tall claim to be made. But there has to be something for this claim to be made. And in the future, maybe there would be more deliberation, identification, which will lead to empirical evidences that tactical nuclear weapons are being manufactured in China. So there are a lot of tall claims, but I go with the assumption that there is a start somewhere which has resulted into the tall claims uh, to come out into this. I think that's it from my end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manoj and Mr. Suresh, for your uh, detailed and uh, excellent, insightful uh, presentation. With respect, we are running short of time. We can take up a few questions which are posted in the uh, chat box. Uh, the first question is by Mr. Obrajan. He has asked, what are ambitions of China in terms of ruling and setting up of the international benchmark? Bala, uh, Bala one second, if I can interrupt you. Yes, sir. I would uh, request both the speakers to look at the questions and have a combined response so that we don't have to look at it. We are one short of time. And there are some people who are to move off for another event. Sure. So I would recommend that they look at the chat box, uh, take cognizance of the questions, and what they think is relevant, uh, very briefly respond to this. Sure, uh, sure, that makes sense. Um, let me just take a, take the questions on 5G, Huawei technology, and all of that. Um, look, uh, China is uh, on 5G in specific. Uh, they are China has done really, really well. It will continue to be at the frontiers of that technology. Um, uh, Huawei will continue to struggle uh, because uh, it is heavily dependent on integrated circuits and other. Uh, uh, core ingredients from the West and the entire supply chain. That doesn't. Uh, it's not going to be easy for the West to cut off their entire supply chain because it's also companies who have their own interests at stake. Um, so it's going to be some time before any of this can actually happen where the Huawei gets cut off. And I don't necessarily think that the company will entirely get cut off. Um, it will impact some of its products, like for example, its mobile phones, which we are seeing. But in terms of its base station technology and all, I think it's reasonably secure. Uh, and it's done massive deployment within China. That's their primary market. Um, and they will do so in other places also. At the end of the day, businesses play a huge role in all of this. And I don't think the US will also completely cut off supply chains because it's not feasible even from their point of view. Um, so in that sense, I don't think that, but that, that will be a point of friction that will remain. And semiconductors will be a weakness for China. Their latest plans also tell us that they are subsidizing 25 NM uh, semiconductors, uh, you know, if you're at 25 NM capacity, even there you are being subsidized, which tells us that they are far away from 14 and 7 NM in those sorts of areas. So they will still be dependent heavily. That will be a lever that they can pull, but they will increasingly get far more self-sufficient. Um, that's on the sort of technology dimension. Um, and that will, of course, feed into PLA development, certainly. Um, that is continuing, that is going to happen. Um, in terms of, let me just take a look at if there are any other questions that I can specifically address. Um, sorry, one second. Uh, on space warfare, unfortunately, uh, I don't think I'm equipped to answer that question uh, in terms of how the PLA is developing a space strategy. But we can at least see with the launch of the, with the completion of the Baidu network, uh, it's at the point where it, where it can decouple significantly and actually even gain space internationally. Uh, but again, that's not my area, so I don't think I should be commenting on that. Uh, in terms of uh, PLA conscripts going to uh, PLA uh, people who've been drawn down from the army going to uh, commercial organizations, actually, that's not really the case. Um, PLA uh, going to PLA commercial organizations, that's not really the case because a lot of the PLA businesses have been shut down by Xi Jinping. In fact, as of last year, systematically, the PLA is out of any business development, at least formally. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily the case. What's happening is that they're trying to absorb them in areas 
where they can. So for example, you, you've got DD Quaidi absorbing them as drivers uh, or in other areas where they've got engineering skills, they'll get absorbed over there. Again, the issues of age and so on and so forth. And that's a friction point that's going to continue with regard to veterans. Um, they've upped pensions, uh, yet uh, it's at the moment, at least based on whatever limited data that the Chinese have put out, pensions are not a massive component of their defense budget, unlike ours. Uh, and that's an advantage from their point of view. Um, but it is going to uh, more than actually pensions and manpower being something that will drain their coffers. What is going to drain their coffers is the kind of force development that they've done with Suyash talked about that when you create, when you build a vessel, it's life cycle, you have to maintain And when you build so many vessels at, the, at such advanced level at the same time, you have to pay for the next 20 years to maintain its life cycle. And that's the cost that they're going to bear. So a lot of their going forward, the expenditure will be on maintenance um, uh, as opposed to necessarily uh, pensions uh, because they're trying to avoid increasing that at it to get to, for that to get to a debilitating level by trying to create commercial opportunities in private sector for them so private companies have these uh, things along with SOEs of course SOEs have to absorb certain quotas so that's how they're trying to manage that um, I don't think it's necessarily the case that they are trying to embed uh, or at least there's very little evidence of them trying to embed PLA personnel in BRI projects, uh, if, uh, at least drawn down PLA personnel. I think what they're trying to do is get more current, uh, you know, people who can provide impetus to get embedded in BRI in one form or the other. Um, that's sort of my take on that. Um, I think there is one India question. Sorry, can you tell me what the India question is? I'm trying to look at it. Um, how do you maintain a force that can uh, that can fight a high intensity war? Ah, okay. So I think one of the things is that as part of this reform, which uh, I presume Suresh mentioned, was that uh, there has been a change in uh, infantry numbers in China. Uh, there has been a reduction in infantry numbers. So that's one thing. I don't think they are interested in having a high intensity conflict with India. I mean, I honestly don't think that's that's what their interest is because at the end of the day, what do you achieve? from that high intensity conflict with India. You are not going to make deep ingress into Indian territory, neither are you going to look to hold it. Uh, what you are trying to do uh, through this is essentially what they are trying to do in Eastern Ladakh and other parts is essentially what they have done in South China Sea, which is sort of, you know, gradual mission creep. Um, and that sort of alters the status quo over time. Um, in, in South China Sea, they encountered very little pushback apart from the early days of 2009, 2010, 11. Um, from regional partners, uh, regional actors. In, in, in India's case, they've obviously encountered pushback and they have stalled. Um, but I think this, this, this is the playbook that we will see going forward. I don't think they're interested in high intensity conflict in the Himalayas uh, or even in Arunachal Pradesh because it, it doesn't allow them to get achieve the political objective that they want to achieve if territory is the political objective. Uh, if the political objective is to quote unquote teach India a lesson, I think even the Chinese understand that there is a significant change in what was there in 1962 and what is there today. Um, so I think, I don't think that's what they're in, interested in. Um, therefore, I don't think that's some one of their worries. What they're, what they're interested in is cultivating enough force superiority uh, through technology and other means that you are able to present a fait accompli. That's to me, to my mind, what they're... Now, of course, once you start something like this, everything can spiral. So the best laid plans can go to dust. Uh, but I don't think that's what they're eventually looking at. I think, yeah. That's it. I think we have covered everything about every question. OK, I think we've covered everything. But in case there's anything else I mean, on specifically what we presented, uh, please feel free to email us. We'll happily respond. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Manoj and Mr. Suresh. I think we have come to the conclusion of what has been a very insightful uh, uh, seminar. Uh, to present the vote of thanks, thank you very much, Mr. Manoj and Suresh, for your insightful seminar. We have definitely learned a lot about the report and decoding China and its actions. Uh, on behalf of C3S, we would like to thank you once again for taking the time out to be with us. We also thank all the participants for their time and for bringing useful discussions to the table. Thank you. One